So in today's video, we're going to cover how to use classic editor build pipelines in Azure DevOps. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is why would we use classic editor? Well, there's kind of two answers for this. The first one's very simple. If you're coming from a TFVC background and you want to build pipelines in Azure DevOps, I could be mistaken, but as, as far as 2021, they force you to use classic editor. There's no option to use YAML as of yet. And the second option is if you came on board to a new team um, or old team rather that's using pre-existing pipelines and they're using classic editor while you come from a YAML background or no background at all, then this is the right video to watch so that you can get familiar with the options they have available in classic editor. So some of the things we're going to cover in regards to classic editor is the variables, the triggers, options, retention, history options they give, as well as last but not least, adding tasks themselves to continue to build your pipeline or edit your pipeline. Okay, so this is going to be a quick introduction to build pipelines inside Azure DevOps. So we'll start by how you get there. Uh, essentially, there's two ways you could get there. First option is you can hover over pipelines over here. And you see this option, pipelines, you can click on that and it'll take you straight to your build pipelines. Alternatively, you can just click on pipelines over here and it'll expand this anyways and you'll be right at pipelines by default. So just an FYI, this video is going to cover specifically how to deal with classic pipeline and I'll show you what that means in a second. I'll make another video that'll cover pipelines with YAML and then maybe a, a super video that con contains both. So before we go over the details of the pipelines themselves, I'll show you some of the options that they show you on the landing page. You see over here on the pipelines, you see recent, all, and run. So recent is self-explanatory. It'll show you the recently run pipelines. If you click on all, it will show you all the pipelines you had. So in this case, I only have one, but had I had more, you'd see all of them pop up here. And runs will show you all of the last successful runs regardless of if it's the same pipeline or a different pipeline. So all you have to do to create a new pipeline is navigate over here where you see a new pipeline, click on it, and they'll give you a couple options. So first thing, as you can see here, they give you a general breakdown, connect, select, configure, review. So essentially you need to select your data source, select um, other specifics inside that data source as in you know which repository, which directory, so on and so forth. Um, then you can pick which default templates you might want to use in terms of tasks. You know, are you building a .NET Core application? Are you building something else? Whatever, what have you. And then finally gives you the option to review your settings and then you can actually um, save and commit your, your build. So again, as I said, this will be about using Classic Editor to build a pipeline. As you can see, they explain to you exactly what that is, which is to create a pipeline without YAML. So let's go ahead and click on that. So over here, you'll see that they give us a couple options right off the bat to pick our data source, whether it's Azure Repos, Git, GitHub, Subversion, Bitbucket, or other Gits. Um, in this case, we're using Azure Repos Git, so that's fine. We can leave this as the default. They give you the option to pick your team project. I happen to only have this one team project, so by default, it's by CICD. Um, same for the repository. I probably should have gave it a different repository name, but as you can see, um, it gives you the option to pick which repository within the team project. And then, of course, the default branch that it's going to be building off of. And in case you're totally new, if you're confused what the team project and repository is, this is your team project over here, CICD. Um, and what I mean by that is if you go back to the organization level, you have these projects over here. In this case, I just happen to call it CICD. And repository is self-explanatory too. Uh, in case you're totally new to it, you know, this is the team project CICD, and then this is inside the repos tab. You could have multiple repositories. I just have the one, and it happens to be called CICD as well, which is why we have the value CICD and CICD again for team project and repository. Okay, so we can hit continue now. So the next step is picking what tasks or job duties or build jobs that we want the build agent to do. Um, they give you a couple default templates, as you can see. They give you, also give you the option to do YAML, but again, we're going to be skipping that for the time being. And we're just going to start by clicking on empty jobs so we can build something totally new for ourselves. 
so now we have the first part of the build setup in which we have a data source or if you come from team city uh, vcs or version control source so the next step is we want to build some tasks out so we can tell the agent to do something to find our build um, but before we get to that i just want to highlight a few things for you here let's highlight on these menu options here and then we can start building out the task so before we start going inside these menu options let's take one step back and cover how we can change the name of the build you may not like the name as CICD dash CI so by default it will take whatever repository name and then add CI to it just two ways you can change the name first option you can navigate the tasks pipe pipeline over here and you can just change the name here so test build as you can see it changes the name up top here as well so if I were to undo that whole thing it goes back I can actually change the name over here as well and it's the same thing just two different places where you can edit the name okay so I think we're ready to move on to the variables tab so we just click on variables and you see we have two options we have pipeline variables and variable groups so at a high level, the main difference between pipeline variables and variable groups is that pipeline variables are variables that are scoped to this particular pipeline, whereas variable groups, you can build a variable set in which you can link, as you can see here, I don't have any, but you can link these variable sets or variable groups to multiple different pipelines, whether they're build or release. So I think we're ready to move on to triggers. So we'll click on this triggers tab. So right off the bat on the left side, we see three main components. We see CICD, uh, continuous integration. We see the option to have it scheduled. We also have it to be dependent on another build to complete. So we can start by enabling continuous integration. We can just click on this checkbox. We see a couple op other options pop up. The first thing that we see is batch changes while a build is in progress. What this basically means is that if we are going to ch uh, build upon every check-in, say that this build takes about 20 minutes to complete, and during those 20 minutes, we have 10 more check-ins, instead of building 10 separate uh, or running 10 separate builds for each check-in, it'll batch all 10 changes and run one build with all 10 changes applied. So next we have branch filters, which is pretty self-explanatory. You have the option to include or exclude certain branches. Um, in this case, by default, we're including the master branch. But for example, we can set the option to exclude the developer branch that I have. So the last option that we see here are path filters. This is exactly what it sounds like in that inside our repository. Let's see, where is it? We can screen out certain paths so that this build can target maybe for example we only want to build it if we have a change checked inside the controllers folder well you can do exactly that just by type in controllers and in that same concept you can exclude say that we don't want anything picked up when we edit something for models you do the same concept here for models so that means that anytime there's a new check-in for that affects a controllers folder it will affect effectively trigger a new build and anytime there's a new check-in under the models folder it will not check in a new build because we're excluding that path all right so next we can revert our attention back to the left side where we have scheduled if we click on add just like linux cron jobs or windows task schedulers um, we can make a scheduled job where we will execute this build. So you can pick what days you want it to be, what time and what time zone. On top of that, you can also filter for which branch you wanna use. Uh, you probably wanna pick your most stable branch, but again, this is totally up to you. They're just giving you the option of flexibility to filter your branch. And in case you wanna delete it, the delete button's just here on the top right corner. So next we have build completion. As you can see, build when another build completes. So it's basically a dependency on another build successfully completing. In this case, I happen to have one other build. So if I select it, it'll once again give you the option to filter out the branches. And otherwise you can save it, or if you want to delete it, it's on the top right corner again. 
Okay, so I think we're ready to move on to the options tab. So if we go over here, we see quite a few things. So we'll start by doing the left side first and then the right side. So it starts off pretty basic in that you can just give a description for it. Um, the other thing you can do is dictate the build number format. So I think by default, it will just take the uh, current date in a month day year timestamp and then dot the iterations for that day but if you decide that you want to have your own um, naming convention if you click on that they do give you some of the variables that you can use so in this case I mean this is YAML but it'll work the same way regardless um, it'll give you the team project name the build definition name and the source branch the timestamp and then the iterations um, and just in case you're wondering this is how you pass along variables inside pipelines the dollar sign parentheses and then end parentheses we can go into that in more detail in uh, a little bit later in the video so next in line they give you some options on how you want to control it when a build is um, queued uh, by default it's enabled so it queues it and then starts it whenever it's available it also gives you the option to queue it but not start and finally gives you the option to not allow you to queue it at all. So next in line, we have these two features automatically link new work in this build, as well as create work item on failure. These are more for uh, metrics, if you will. So if you enable it, you have the option to pick which branch and it'll build a work item. Um, same concept. If you were to enable this based on failure, it'll create an issue or bug epic task. I'm sorry, not bug epic or task and lastly on the left hand side you see some things about the status as well as some important URLs that you can give these are you know the URL for the build itself as well as the, the uh, specific branch it's pointing to so finally we can move on to the right hand side um, first we can start with build job authorization scope Project collection means that if the build needs to be accessible to multiple projects, while current project means if you want to restrict this build to have access only to this project scope. Uh, the next two are pretty self-explanatory. They're just timeout times. Um, and finally, we have the build job demands. So build job demands are essentially what it says right here, specify which capabilities the agent must have to run in this pipeline. So say for example, um, whether it's Azure hosted or your own hosted agent, you need to target a specific version of .NET Core or some other you know, application dependency. You can type that in here, we'll just write uh, .NET for example, and then you can choose a condition whether it equals a certain value or you know that certain software exists okay so next we can move on to retention retention is essentially how long you're going to keep the information about this particular build up on azure such as you know the days to keep the artifacts the days to keep the runs days to keep the pull request and number of recent runs to retain per pipeline so on and so forth they give you additional options over here but it's pretty self-explanatory. How long are you going to keep all this information about this build? Okay, so before we go to history, I want to make sure that we save it. It's a brand new build and we haven't even saved it yet. So if you click over here, you see three options. Um, save as a draft is grayed out right now because again, it's a brand new build. There's no previous instance to save it against as a draft. So you only have the option to save it or save it in queue. That's self-explanatory, save and queue means it will save it and then run it immediately, save is just save. So we'll just hit save. You see this option show up. Um, what this is doing is giving you the option to neatly organize your builds. So you, if you do it at this, it'll be at the root level of your pipelines page that we saw earlier. Alternatively, you can make new folders and you know, organize your builds. So you could say, you know, this is uh, all .NET Core apps, this is all Angular apps, and so on and so forth, as well as add a comment. So, you know, good practice to add a comment. And for now, we'll just leave it at the, uh, you know, root level and you hit save. Okay, so now we can inspect the history and we see that the initial commit is 
The only thing inside history, if we click over here, we have the option to compare the difference as well as revert pipeline. They're both grayed out because there is nothing else to compare against. So let's go ahead and change that. By going to variables, we'll add test, um, and the value will be test. And if we were to save it here, you know, added test variable, and you hit save. If you go to history now, it'll show you what kind it was. Initial commit is an add. Now we're updating it. If you go over here, you have the option to compare the difference between those two. Just like in Visual Studio or many other comparison tools, you see it's highlighted already for you, so you can easily find out what's changed. You can hit back here, and alternatively, if I don't like the changes that I've made, you can revert the entire pipeline here as well. Not going to do that right now, but you have the option for it. So next we can click back to tasks and on the pipeline, we see this triple ellipsis at the end, add phase options. And we see two additional options that we can add here, which is another agent job. If you see over here, this is an agent job. Um, and an agent job at a high level is essentially a server, whether it's Microsoft hosted or your own hosted agent inside of an agent pool or an agentless job, which does not have a server at all. It just runs the tasks. Um, usually agentless jobs will have a more limited selection. You can actually click on learn more about jobs to see what selection they give there. Next over to the right, as we discussed earlier, you can change the name of the build here. Here you can actually choose the agent pool. In this case, Azure Pipelines is Microsoft hosted, but were I to have um, my own network of agents inside of an agent pool, I'd be able to add that as well. I can make another video on how to add an agent pool as well as agents on that agent pool. Um, the next is picking your agent specification in terms of OS. They have a couple options here. So next we can move on to get sources. Um, at a glance, you see some of the same options we saw when we we're first setting up the build, but we see some expanded options here. The first one to take note of is the option to clean, which is essentially purging the directory. Um, if we set it to true, we have some options for it, which is clean out sources, sources and output directory, sources directory and all build directories. For now, I'll turn it back to false. So next we see the option to tag sources, which essentially um, you can control it based on never tag, on success tag, or always tag. And the option that they give you is that basically when you're building, whether you choose to be on success or always, all the files will be tagged with the build number or a format of uh, a tag format that you add here so that you can easily identify which build it came from. So last but not least, we have these last four options. The first one is report build status, which will essentially tell you if it's successful or failure inside the UI. The other option is to check out submodules, and it gives you a recursion level, top, or any nested submodules within. The third is check out files from LFS, which is for large files. Um, this one I'd put an asterisk on because I feel like I've easily been able to uh, check out files that are over a gig without this being enabled. But either way, if you're not sure, you can click on more information to uh, get more information about it. And last but not least, you have don't sync sources, which gives you a nice explanation here. When selected, configure local working directory, but skips sources. Okay, so one final module to check out before we begin adding tasks, which is clicking on the agent job itself, or you could also have an agentless job. Either way, they'll have a few default things where you could change the name of the agent job. So, you know, just, we'll just call it agent. And you see that the name is changing here. Once again, they give you the option to target an agent pool or just inherit from where you dictated inside the pipeline option at the very top. The reason they give you this is because you may have additional agent jobs. So while the default points to this agent pool, your additional agent jobs may point to another agent pool. So say that we had another agent pool, this job might pick that while this one picks, you know, your default. So to remove an agent job, by the way, just go to the top right corner, 
click remove and it will change this um, back to inherited but you can see that if you actually click on agent job for in this case we're picking the Microsoft hosted they give you the options again to pick the, um, the OS but for now we'll just do inherited from pipeline because we already set that up um, again just like in the options they give you the options to pick some demands for the agent so next they give you some control on how many agents will be running this build if you click on this you'll see that none just means that it runs on this single agent otherwise you can set it up so that you have multiple agents running it and set the you know amount that you want and lastly they give some some of the information about the timeouts and job cancel timeout as well as dependencies over here so finally we're down to the additional options first thing you see is allow scripts to access the auth token so that basically means that if you have any tasks or scripts that need to use authentication you are going to want to enable this and it will use the agent's environment token to be able to authenticate if you click on this it pretty much says the same information and finally the option of you know when to run this job if you click on the drop down you have a couple of options only when all previous jobs have succeeded uh, even if a previous job has failed only when a previous job has failed all right so we're finally ready for the meat and potatoes of agent jobs so whether you have agent agentless job it's the same in that you go to the agent you click on the plus sign and you see that you have a bunch of tasks here that you can add you can search for any number of things that you want to add here in this case for this video we'll just add a simple PowerShell that's just gonna you know say hello world you can click on add and you see it shows up over here again just like anything else you can change the name of it you know and the rest of this is specific for this task so you don't really need to worry about it unless you actually need to run a PowerShell task all right, so let's finish building out this job. Uh, by default, it says hello world anyway, so we're set. Um, we'll ignore the rest of this for now since it's specific to a partial task. We just want to be able to run it. So in this case, if you notice now, if we click on save, we have all three options available. Save as a draft so that we don't interrupt the actual current build that we have running. Just regular save and save in queue. In this case, we're going to save in queue, but before I click that, Alternatively, if you don't want to save it as a draft either, and you just want to undo everything you've done, other than hitting back, you can just hit discard and you'll discard all the changes. So in this case, we're not going to do that. We're going to save and queue. Once you click on that, it'll give you the option to add a comment to this build that you're about to execute right now. For that instance, um, it also gives you a couple options again to once again be able to change your agent pool that you're targeting as well as your agent specification. And finally, the branch. By default, we picked master, but in case that we wanted to run another branch, it gives you the option to do so here. As well as uh, advanced options, we don't have any variables that we can set at queue time or demands, uh, except for the .NET exists. But we can, we can delete this one for now since we're not doing the .NET application. And before I hit save and run, I think I want to show you actually adding a variable. So I will go to variable. So as you just saw, there was the option to change some variables, but not all of them. The reason why is because you have to toggle on or off the option to set them at queue time. In this case, I'm going to turn it on. So if I were to <clears throat> hit save and queue, I would be able to see that as an option but before i do that i might as well discuss one more thing which is changing the variable type to a secret so at this point if you have like a token or any other information that's important but you don't want everyone on the team that's able to queue this build or edit this build to be able to see that information you could set it as a secret so at this level before i save it if i were to click it again i can still see the value but the moment i hit save over here you know added a uh, secret variable save it now if I go over here to try to see the value again it's empty I won't be able to see it again so other than that one thing I want to edit is this is not a valid syntax so I'm just gonna remove that and let's save and queue it so now if we go to variables we do see the option to edit test value by default as a secret but you can change it anyways if you need to 
but otherwise we are ready to save and run. So now this is what it looks like when you actually queue your build. If you click, well, right here you see a couple options. You'll see what repository it's coming from, what branch, and then the commit ID. Um, as well as once it's completed, if we were to have artifacts or work items related, it will all be completed and information would show here. Um, otherwise, you can click on the agent over here where it says queued, and you can get the actual build logs for it. In this case, it's finished already. So now that it's complete, let's just run through exactly what we're looking at inside the log. So the first step, it'll just tell you that it's been able to connect to the age, uh, agent pool, as well as give you the information about that agent pool, you know, what image it's running as. Otherwise, it will show you, you know, some information about what it might need, what dependencies it might have. In this case, it needs to have PowerShell, so it's going to check that it has PowerShell. Uh, next, it's going to check out to the repository. Next, this is our PowerShell step that we actually call it Say Hello. As you can see, it gives you the information about the task itself that we chose. And there's the output, hello. Finally, to show you some information about the post, checkout, uh, job completion. And then it reports the build status. So before we end this video, there's just one last thing I want to show, which is how you can use your variables. I'm only going to show you how to use a pipeline variable. Um, because the way in which you use variables is the same whether it's pipeline variable or variable group. The only difference is that for pipeline variables, again, it's scoped to this project. You add it here, you're good to go. Whereas variable groups, you create in another place called library. So if we take a look inside here, <clears throat> I would create a new variable group here and then associate that or link it here. And that'll be another uh, video in itself. But anyways, that being said, um, let's make a new variable here. So we'll say message. And this is going to say, hello, YouTube. Okay, we can choose to toggle it on and off at setable IQ time, doesn't matter. Um, so once we have that, since we want to consume that, all we want to do instead of or in addition to write host hello world, we'll, we will say write host. So you have to use the syntax, which is dollar sign, and then open and close parentheses message. So if we were to save and queue this now, and we actually run it, we should expect to see hello YouTube in addition to hello world. As you can see right here, it does indeed say hello YouTube. So that's how you consume a variable inside your pipeline. So I think we're ready to explore some additional options we have with the build definition. If you click at this level, we'll go to the pipelines, we'll select the build, and you hover over here, you see more actions under the vertical ellipses. If you click on that, you see a couple of things that come up, manage security, clone, save as template, export as JSON, export as YAML, and obviously delete. So if you click on manage security, you'll see what groups inside Azure DevOps have access to this build as well as what rights they have. So in terms of can they edit, can they only view. Um, this whole concept of access groups is a really deep and big conversation in and of itself, but I just want you to know where you can find these options. So next we have pause pipeline, which is self-explanatory. Uh, the other one we have is rename and move. So as I explained earlier, if you want to neatly organize all of your builds, you can do so here. So if you go over here to select folder by default, we just see that it's a default project folder at the root level. But what if we were to say, uh, you know, YouTube videos and we hit save, 
if we go back to pipeline we see that not only has this YouTube video folder been created but test build is now underneath that YouTube build folder so if you click on status badge you'll essentially see the same options we saw inside the build definitions options where you see the default branch that it's pointing to the uh, pipeline scope as well as the link to the actual build itself now if you hit clone it's going to do exactly that if you click on that it's going to clone your build it's going to take by default the name of your build and add dash clone have the same exact features why might you do this well you know maybe you have an identical build in terms of the build steps but you just need to change the repository or something else similar to that like the data source or something um, or you just need to build upon extra features but you don't want to have to build all the previous steps since they're the same as the build that you cloned it from you can do that um, as a clone but to do those things there are other ways that you can do it such as uh, exporting the build um, but a good use for clone is when when there's a issue with the build that's live and the team's already working and using it and they have a branch that's working maybe like a feature branch that's uh, not working the mass is working so they can continue work but you need to fix the feature branch issues you can clone it and then you can make all your changes to resolve that and let them know um, and go about it that way so that's a good use for it as well so if you have a build definition that can be used for numerous applications because the build jobs are the same but the data source or uh, data source might be different or there's just slight variations you need to make um, you can save the base build as a template and I'm gonna call it you know base example build you hit save so the next time I want to make the new build that's mostly identical if not identical and I go to new pipeline and I use classic editor again in this case um, you know so I find we'll just imagine that I have another repository um, that I'm targeting for it to simulate that I'll just target a different branch if you go here and you type in base example build and you hit apply sure enough you have the same exact settings that we had in the one that we based the template off of and you can save it and queue it accordingly so now if you want to export your build you can export it either as a JSON or YAML um, in this case we'll just click on export as JSON you see it down here and if I drag this over here you see that it's my downloads and my build download if I go to pipelines again and I want to import this now you simply just click on the vertical ellipses import a pipeline and I can drag this guy right in here import it and sure enough it's there some of the settings might get uh, reset such as you can see the agent pool but you know that's fine that's working as intended because you're not trying to save the exact same build you're just trying to save the steps correlating to it but if you're exporting it you might have the need that you need to take it to a different organization or a different project and you want to be able to just share that with your team members so that they don't need to go through the painstaking steps of rebuilding uh, a pipeline that your team already figured out so that pretty much wraps it up for this video where we basically went through all the options available to you inside classic editor for build pipelines um, I didn't show you how to build the .NET Core application or any specific applications because I feel like those are very specific to, um, you know, specific use case scenarios. I just wanted to give an overview of what's available, what options are available to you so that you can build your pipeline as needed as well as have awareness of where to find all the options. So I hope that was helpful um, and I hope that was a good introduction to classic editor for build pipelines and I think the next time I'll try to focus on YAML builds and we'll slowly move our way towards release pipelines as well as go into more detail about how to set up agent pool how to set up a service connection how to set up deployment pools and so on and so forth so otherwise thanks for watching hope you learned something and feel free to like subscribe and leave a comment